season four, episode 55 of Brackets, Bubbles, and Bit Stealers. I am Sam Fetterman. That is Jonathan Litskin. Thank you so much for tuning in today and spending part of your Monday with us. And I'd also like to thank Curry Hicks Sage for joining us on this Monday evening. How are you doing tonight? Great to be here, fellas. I'm impressed by the music. I was kind of bobbing my head. I was sort of hoping that that would that would continue. I'm I'm impressed by just, you know, as a sort of low tech 38 year old, it's good to know that there are youngsters out there who are sort of putting together these. This looks like quasi legitimate. So I, I commend you as uh, someone who is, um, you know, just kind of all all voice, no cattle, if you will. This yeah, that well, mu- that intro music was just something very random that I found while like searching uncopyrighted music on. Not random at all. It's a banger. I mean, I I that's the sort of song you could you could imagine yourself walking into in a Vegas club after sort of a, a shoddy streak at the roulette table, and uh you know maybe before in your case before you know some sort of mid tier conference tournament game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. We obviously bring you on here to talk about search season and everything about um, the coach search that is just such a – it's a different universe from everything else in college basketball that we, we tend to try and talk a lot about the game, and then we have to pivot as soon as the tournament bracket comes out to talk about the bracket so much. and But we also have to talk about the offseason because the offseason starts before the season ends. And – what better person to talk about that with, with than with you? And the first thing that we want to discuss is the job that kind of took a little took some of the headlines over the weekend. Ohio State promoting Jake Diebler to being the full time head coach, removing the interim tag. Sage, how do you think they arrived at that? I'll tell you, I hadn't given a whole lot of thought to it. And now I want to give a whole lot of more thought to it because I'm leaning toward the possibility that there was something, I don't want to say sinister here, but there's more than meets the eye, and I'd like to get to the bottom of it. I'm not terribly plugged in in Columbus, but I'll I'll say this. I received, I asked one person who would know, and the response was simply, Diebler is very well connected with the right people there. I don't know precisely what that means, but the person who shared this would absolutely know. You don't have to believe me, but I think you know that my track record's, record's fairly good in this stuff. And uh, then another person was like, kind of just an assistant coach somewhere not related to this or someone who follows the landscape and said something to the effect of, um, this is a weird precedent and it feels as if perhaps this was set up from the beginning. Or at the very least, it was an opportunity. If you think about it, the timing of Holtman's departure, and I don't want to get all like tinfoil hatty um, and overly speculative, but the timing of his departure was curious insofar as like he left, what, February 10th-ish? Maybe? It was Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. The Valentine's Day massacre, if you will. And... Um, that gave Diebler sufficient time to get it done or to get ultimately to get enough done such that it was deemed sufficient to, to, to retain him. And I mean, given some of the alternatives that were being bandied about, there's no universe in which Diebler is objectively the right guy based. Like, again, he may become John Wooden. I'm not saying that, but just based on sort of like, what's out there and i had a third source who who hit me who's really plugged in and he said um and and to be honest i I haven't even sought a lot on this just this these are just things from people who are interested in this particular search and he said something that it's very hard at certain football centric schools to make a basketball hire without a lot of politics in the way i don't precisely know what he's referring to but it did something similar happen with Rodney Terry, although there by, but he got to an elite eight. So I think it's a totally different scenario, whatever you think of the, of the, of the move, this one, you know, he didn't get to the tournament ultimately it was, it was, it was very, it would have been very difficult to do so. So I'm not begrudging him for that, but given that, you know, 
Dusty May was pretty firmly in the mix by by most by most accounts. And given that there were some some other candidates who were pretty seriously in the mix at one point, I mean, McDermott used it to get an extension at, at Creighton. Um, I don't know how serious the Sean Miller thing ever was, but you know, if they wanted to, like, they could have just waited and kind of gone after a DeVries or, or whomever was the hot name. It's Ohio State. They have tons of money. So I don't even remember your original question, but it was a strange, it was a very strange one and it, it will totally scramble um, the search season dynamics this year by taking one of the hottest jobs off the board entirely and giving it to someone who is already there. So it doesn't, it doesn't lead to that kind of carousel activity that you might that you you typically expect this time of year yeah it it definitely felt interesting because i mean i was thinking that they were probably gearing up for a big money hire i think we all assumed that they were i mean they spent 14 million dollars for chris holtman to not coach their team only for one of chris holtman's assistants to be their coach well and it's worth but it is worth noting they spent that money but then uh, some of that by by Holtman getting the DePaul job, uh, uh, probably a significant chunk of that will offset. Then you hire Diebler for cheaper, and in the end, it might be kind of a wash. And the fourteen million might be, you know, I'm sure they'll have to pay some of it, but it won't be nearly as prohibitively expensive as it sounds and at first glance. No, but my my point there was like if they're willing to pay that type of money to get out of a coach. No, no, but I'm saying I'm saying. They, it appears that they are, but they're not because that some of that offset, like, so they're not going to pick up the whole tab for Holtman at DePaul. I don't know. I don't know what was ultimately agreed upon, but in other words, that 14 million, like, yeah, they'll pay some of it to DePaul, but between, you know, what DePaul will pay, that will offset some of that 14, right? And then hiring a guy internally for cheaper, it kind of like, let's say they were going to pay someone five, right? Now, like, net net if you take out you know let's say now instead of 14 some of it offsets and it's nine i'm making up the figures it's nine and you pay someone three million dollars less than you might have been able to right on the open market then over time like the total cost becomes do you know what i'm saying yeah Yeah. i'm i I see what you're getting at so yes like what you're saying i agree with initially i was like what's the point of firing someone for 14 million if you're not going to go make a splash higher but I think actually maybe they're kind of doing it on the cheap and like that's all factored in. It's possible that they did that. Um, but did did anyone did your most plugged in people think that think that Diebler had a chance at the job when he got it? Like there there's a reason. No, I, it, it came as a complete surprise to virtually everyone. Exactly. It, 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 a- I think that behind this then that's why i'm saying i think behind the scenes like i don't think that it came about one day miraculously i think there was probably people pushing very well connected people money people at the university pushing fairly early right and that they just needed enough to make that case to the to the new ad um and you know I guess they saw enough. Now it's a curious thought experiment. If he finished like, because what was he like, seven and two, something like that? Yeah, they were really good. And I think when I saw, two, yeah, I I actually really wanted to. I was really excited for their press conference um, against when when they beat Rutgers because I was at that game, but they just dipped. Um, they didn't, they didn't give a presser. Well, I mean, whatever the re, whatever the fact. I mean, I just feel like there's the. I haven't seen much coverage of it. I'm sure. I'm sure stuff will come out. I I suspect they've kind of sanitized it and just made it seem like he just did enough and got the job. You know, it, which to some degree is true. But you don't get that job um, while missing the tournament. And you know, like again, if it was nine and zero, even that would be like it's not. It wasn't perfection. It was very impressive, but it's such a small sample size. And what did he get for a deal? I didn't see that. I haven't seen anything either. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not sure. Which is curious in its own right, by the way. Like all mm-hmm. we've seen basically is like, you know, the tweets from the national guys who are pretty much like, you know, Diebler will be the next coach kind of thing, right? Yeah. So it's curious that like we haven't seen any terms 
And I just wonder. Oh, hold on. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Probably annual three. base annual base salary two point five. No, but how many years? How many years? Um, until twenty twenty nine. What? He got a full on five year deal. Yeah. Holy shit! So it's also, five years. Also, five also years. Like Ohio State eight. only hiring a coach for like two and a half million dollars seems a little bizarre. The amount of money they have. Well, that guys, it, it, I'm gonna just pee really quick. I, I, I apologize. I'll mute myself. Right, that's, that's fine. Yeah, but what I think this does is they'll extend him if he's good. They'll fi- they'll they'll be able to fire him if he's bad because at two point five, that buyout's not going to be that crazy. So, yeah, I do wonder. I, I do wonder about the full five years. That's that's. That's insane to me. It's also it's just interesting to me because like, if you're only hiring a coach for for two point five with Ohio State's budget, like, is it maybe like was it maybe a case of like they just kind of landed on him because like the names they also were like looking into really like didn't want the job or just like weren't were, were because out there. you didn't want because you didn't want the job, just like the just like other guys that they were like looking at no one in specific like because like. It's just a little strange to me that Ohio State is only paying two and a half million dollars for a coach. Maybe they weren't willing to go up to however much Dusty or McDermott wanted. I find that really hard to believe. Um, I'm loath to speculate too much because I just I just have to talk to people there and I, I'm not super plugged in there. Um, I was just following it as a regular search, talking to the sources I talked to and the people who would know about like who was being interviewed and, you know, they obviously took a look at Lamont Paris. He got South Carolina. Um, now I do. What, what day was he, what day did that happen? By the way, that he got the job. Yeah. Saturday. Saturday. I was at, the, I was at the final. I remember. Okay, where so I, was. I think I'll say this. Um, I do, I do think like the dusty sweepstakes are kind of important here. Um, and Michigan opened Friday. And so I could imagine a scenario, and again, pure conjecture on this one. This is not sourced. Could imagine a scenario in which, like, Dusty or DeVries or whomever that was, like, maybe, maybe interested was kind of, like, waiting to see what else opened uh, or waiting to go through the, the process at some other places. And... Ohio State not being like the clear cut, that's the one we want. And Diebler and his camp just being like, we'll take it for cheap. We badly want it. The players kind of saying like, you know, we'll stick around. Whatever it is that, that you know, and the money people who are who are supportive of him may be saying we'll eat the cost. Like, who knows? But obviously he was he was well liked by the right people. And that's that's all I can say about that. I wish I wish if you told me I would have tried to hunt down a little more detail today. It's a little tough because a lot of people are very busy this week for obvious reasons. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. At the portal, the tournament, everything. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, do you, um, what's the next one that you want to get into? Yeah, the next. I kind of wanted to stay in the conference and go north because it seems like Michigan's casting a pretty wide net in terms of candidates for replacing Juwan Howard. I've heard like. I haven't heard, I should, should say, but, like, I've seen names of, like, high academic guys like Kyle Smith to, like, D- Dusty May, other, like, top candidates. Sage, what 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 have you kind of heard about this Michigan job? Are you – I don't – like, it's funny because Kyle was at Columbia, but I don't really think of him as, like, high as high academic. He's at Wazoo. It's not, like – I mean, he's – Yeah, no, I, I just – But, like, the, the point is, like, he's proven that he can win at a high academic spot. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've kind of heard a little bit of everything. I, I definitely heard, I actually heard, I don't know what I'm, I'm trying to think of, like, am I burning any sources here? I heard, like, last Monday, four days before it went down, that Ward Manual was reaching out to, you know, kind of a kitchen cabinet of advisors sort of around basketball, uh, you know, that world. And that he was intrigued by DeVries. And that was the first name I heard. Now, 
I do think that that was also because DeVries had won the day before. Um, and remember, like, there's this interesting dynamic where, and I think there, a lot of the DeVries and Shirts chatter is partly a function of just how good they've been, partly a function of the fact that they can kind of go around and talk to whoever they want for a week guilt-free because the Missouri Valley um, finishes a week early, right? Yeah. So you're just kind of waiting for Selection Sunday. And I think there's just – it's very easy for those guys. That's why you saw both of their names. It's not a coincidence, right? All, all this is born out of timing. And so both of them were like pretty firmly you know, in the mix last week at a lot of jobs and having their names thrown around, whereas other candidates were still coaching. So – you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't put too much stock in like the DeVries being an early name at Michigan, but definitely I think it, I feel confident saying it was one. Um, Dusty May definitely is, you know, remains like the pick of the prize of the pack based on what he did last year and getting back to the tournament this year. What's worth noting, though, is that and I, I've said this to a lot of people today, and this is just how it is this time of year. You don't have to like it, but it's a reality. Whomever performs best this weekend basically will have i'm not going to say a leg up on the field but it will 100 percent inform the hire to a certain extent um i'm not saying if that's a good or bad thing there's arguments on both sides i'm just noting that like if dusty dismantles northwestern and by the way there's like some i think there's a fringe i wouldn't put it high uh possibility of a Chris Collins being in the mix there. Um, I don't think he'll do it. He's got a really good situation at Northwestern and a really, you know, a, a steep buyout. And uh, there's a lot to like in his contract. And it's a place that really is effectively probably never going to be able to fire him at this point. Um, yes. But again, like if, if Dusty dismantles Chris Collins in game one and then loses, you know, has it, you know, within two possessions at the under eight and gives it a nice run against UConn. Like I think his stock remains as high as it is at this moment. You can also see a scenario in which he gets blown out by 24 against Northwestern. And after, you know, ending the year with losses to kind of a banged up Northwestern team and temple in the conference semis, the luster or the shine, you know, wears a little thinner and coupled with, a Kyle Smith or Darren DeVries or, um, you know, somebody I mean, else. Say it again. I mean, Smith and DeVries are playing each other. So. Correct. That's like, I've joked that that plus the Collins and um, Dusty the game are kind of like the semifinals of the, of the Michigan bowl for who gets Michigan, you know, uh, they're not going to play each other in the final. So sort of an imprecise analogy, but you get the point. Um, but yeah. So like, I, I think that there's a, there's but and there are there are probably others that I'm not even thinking of. But if DeVries or um Smith make a sweet 16, right? Or Nico Medved ha- like runs really great offense, or sort of like some of that beeline, um, not necessarily in his offense, but just in the sense that like the tactician, the consummate tactician, they have an appetite. And he's won at a bunch of different places as well, like beeline did, yeah, and so. Like Medved, you know, Medved could also lose in the playing game and he gets no job this year, you know? So there's, but there's, a, there's guys who are trying out for Michigan this weekend. Right. And I don't think they're going to lock in a hire before the weekends. end. and even if they do, like, even if they have a handshake deal in principle, it, it's, it's not, listen, like, Todd Golden, when he got the job at Florida, I mean, you have to assume that deal was done before the game against Murray State, right? And then, because the next day after the game, he was like there, you know? So that doesn't happen that night, right? So it's very possible Dusty or someone else could enter the weekend with a deal. What I'm saying is if you get dismantled by 40, uh, you know, when you haven't announced it and you don't announce it, right? Like it's trickier. There are, I, you know, there are scenarios in which look like last year, Ed Cooley was clearly done and he lost in the first round and nothing changed. Right. George Shen didn't have the leverage. I'm just saying Michigan can get 
any number of candidates. And it's and if Dusty gets beat by 40 and one of the others is has a spectacular opening weekend, like I think it probably does, at least in the minds of some of the fan base, change things materially a bit. And that that's the that's the danger of the NCAA tournament for me. I think a lot of the times so much value is placed on the NCAA tournament in not just coaching searches, but in how we just watch and how people evaluate college basketball. This is one thirty fifth of the season. Is- I know, but it's, it's you're, the most important part. But you're going to Mac games and you're like a search. But like at the end of the day, it's a it. The, the system is the system. It's a one and done tournament. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny that. And it's the most important 35th of the season, but like dusty, like I don't think dusty may losing by 20 to Northwestern, which I, I, I honestly think it, it's more likely to be the other way that FAU wins by 20. Just yeah. based, and I, and I might, and I don't know who I'm picking in that game yet, but like, I think FAU is more likely to win a blowout, but regardless, Dusty Way, Dusty May losing that game by twenty doesn't make him a worse coach than it did in the morning that he woke up. I don't think. I agree. I do think though, like it's just easier to weave a narrative based on you know it's like they lost the temple, they lost. There, there's just I'm not. I'm just saying if if there are detractors who for whatever reason want to detract, they'll use it as a compelling data point, and it 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 sticks in the mind of. You know, can in some instances stick in the mind of the 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 hiring manager. You know, in this case, Ward Manuel. I, 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 you know, and again, I'm not even certain Dusty is like the clear cut favorite there, because I think he'll he's probably increasingly firmly in the mix at Louisville too, um, and that's for a variety of reasons which we can get into. But I'll let you get to your next question. I don't want to. I don't want to segue with no, that. I just wanted but to like my, the whole, but like my take on Dusty May is like. At FAU, the only coach that had won 20 games there was Mike Jarvis, and he did it once, and he won 21. Nobody else had even won 19. Dusty May comes in his first two years, wins 17. He wins 19 in 2022 when they go 1-12 in in one-score games, or or like five-point games. I think that's what he said. Um, Then he wins 60 games over the next two years at a place that has won 20 games once. Yeah, it's a it's a garbage job. I mean, I mean, he's made it a good job, and now they're building facilities and all the rest. But yeah, yeah it's a that's gonna be job. A, that's gonna be a player FAU. That they'll be a player somewhere. Like I, I think that FAU has the has the ability to 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 bring in a good a good coach as well. Now that Dusty's proven, hey, you can win here. Facilities are better. We're in a much better league. I, I think they'll I think they'll attract somebody, but. Louisville, you, you kind of took us to it. Jonathan, you, you look like your eyes are wide open. Yeah, no, no, no. I just wanted to add that, like, I do think that there's a part of this. And, like, while I agree with you, Sam, about the NCAA tournament kind of narratives, and we talk about this all the time, but, like, not everyone thinks like that. And, like, not – the, and there's a part of this that, like, you have to go out and, like, win the press conference, so, so to speak. And, like, if, like – if the people that are paying his contract don't think like that, like, what's the point? Like, there, yeah, there is, I mean, you, there is a part of this where you have to please people. You also have to remember, I'm I'm increasingly of the mind that I don't really think Michigan and Ohio State truly give that much of a shit about basketball right now. Like, don't get me wrong. There's obviously people well-heeled people, you know, alums of all sorts. There's, there's obviously a lot of people who care about the basketball team at Michigan, like no doubt, but especially coming off of a football national championship and just in terms of like revenue totals, it really is kind of a drop in the bucket for the department and they want to be good. Otherwise they wouldn't have fired, you know, Juwan Howard, but I'm not certain that it's going to be like the same dynamics in terms of donor pressure or, I think it's probably mostly going to be Ward Manual, you know, speaking with a kitchen cabinet. Maybe he retains a search firm, whatever. Talks to, you know, the sort of six or eight agents that are prominent in the sport. Uh, you know, talks to whoever he does about basketball specific stuff. And 
you know, he makes the decision. And as long as it's not an egregious one that's so wildly kind of off base, his people will more or less, you know, the people, the money people and the rest will more or less defer to him. Right. Um, and I just don't know if it's as as uh, for like a search season head who loves this stuff. It's super exciting. I think for Ward, it, it is to a degree, but it's it's not clear to me that this is like a make or break hire for him. You know, I mean, yeah, like or anyone at Michigan, really. For like Michigan, no, no, no administrator at Michigan's job is on the line because of basketball. Correct. That's just kind of where it stands. But, like, does that not, like, why is there, there should still be an incentive to hire a good coach. Like, you want to have a good program. Yeah, fully. And I don't, I don't think he's, like, going to hire a bad coach. I'm, I think the, all the names we're talking about are really oh, good. I think the know? four, yeah, the four names that were, that were talked about are, are great, great coaches. And I don't think they could go wrong with any of them. Chris Collins has had success in that league, three NCAA tournaments in a place that had never made it before. Yeah, and, and I think he has the 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 leverage to kind of not like Jawan didn't have head coaching experience, right? And so he's not going to do that again. You know, the one fringe candidate somebody threw around. I don't know if there's anything real to this, so I want to be very careful in what I'm saying. Uh, was Shaka Smart? Just because he's kind of a Midwestern guy from Madison. No, you know. I can't see it. I, I can't I've, see it. People have I've, talked so much about Shaka. I've, how much I've actually hated heard that too. School. I, I've actually heard that too. But like I don't, I don't think I don't think it's real either. I well, just I'll just remember. say this: here's the hypothetical. Shaka has been utterly fantastic at Marquette, and that team is so enjoyable to watch. I think they could make a national get run to the national title game. I also think he's been, and you know, goes back to your point about the one thirty fifth thing. He's not made a second weekend since the twenty eleven Final Four at VCU. Yeah. Yep. And. Steve Lutz is a really good coach at Western Kentucky, and that felt like a weird 15 seed. I feel like they, they're more 13, 14. You yeah, know? we were just talking about We were talking were, about this an hour before the show. <laughs> and we I, were, I haven't watched them, I, but it's just. They so have I some good them. kids. They have some good kids. And he always gets players. He always coaches them up. He's really solid. He's very well regarded by a lot of people I like in, bas- in college basketball. I couldn't tell you the first thing about Western Kentucky. I haven't seen him play a single time. I'm mostly locked in. Our coaches they play players. super fast. So, and like you get to track me, I don't, you know, I, it sounds like Colec will be back, but I just am saying, and then they have to play Florida in the second game, most likely, right? Well, it if, is, if, if Florida makes it, they're without their big man. Yeah, but it is not a, it's, there, there's a real scenario in which you can imagine Marquette not making. The Sweet 16. Oh, absolutely. I'll put them in this final four probably in one of my brackets, but in others, I you know, I may not. And if 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 Lutz beats him or something, a 15-2 game, you talk about a narrative around Shaka, right? I mean, he did he lost to Texas to Abilene Christian. I don't know what he did his first year at Marquette. I can't remember in 2022. Oh, they, they, um, they, yeah, the they lost like 86 to 51 to UNC. In what was the seeding? Eight nine. It was an eight nine game. Wow, I have no recollection of that game, but that's there. You yeah, go, neither right? do I. I and then remember. last year they lost to Michigan State. So I'm just saying, if I'm Ward Manuel and I see that, and there's like any lingering kind of like anti Shaka sentiment from the Marquette fan base, I'm like, I'll take them right now, you know, and. That's all I would have to say about that. I don't think it's real, but I'm just I'm just saying. I don't think Shaka would take this. I feel I feel like we've we've seen a million different times about Shaka hated being at a football school. There's a reason he went to Marquette. It's a basketball school. He's the he's the show. He's what matters. And like would Michigan going to Michigan would just be a step right back to Texas. Yeah, I I, I was too just think like that's true, but. He's a Midwest guy, and Michigan's a little different than Texas, and he grew up in a Big Ten college town. I mean, he went to Kenyon College in Ohio. I mean, there, there's just – culturally, it, it feels much closer to what he would covet than Texas does. But, yeah, I think you're broadly right. I'm just throwing it out there as a little bit of a provocative side point. Last thing on Michigan is, like, their NIL for basketball, like, as bad as, like, I've heard it is. 
Uh, I don't have exact figures. I've heard it's not ideal. I think they're working on it. I talked to someone, um, someone very, 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 very connected at Michigan. And they were like, they had spoken to Ward fairly recently. And essentially the plan was like, they're, they're getting there, but they okay. are saying we're not going to be top in the league. Right. And okay. there's, you know, there's been since the beginning of an L, what are we in now? Like year three kind of, yeah. um, so it's 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 not been like there have been instances at michigan where so there's there's the thing about michigan is there's money obviously and there are people who will use that money for nil but at the outset there was instances of kind of just like one-off alums funding a kid or and so the infrastructure of like what people don't realize about nil i think is that it takes work you know, you have to set the deals up and, and run the website. And, you know, there's vendors that you have to navigate and fundraise. And there's so I think that Michigan's getting there on that front now, but it took a little while. And their biggest money people, some some of them remain reluctant about the whole enterprise. In football, my understanding is like they're really good at getting like the top kids, but then there's a big drop off. Um, they're figuring it out. The national title obviously helped. They have, I think. They have one really prominent collective, maybe another. So it's coming along, but it's not you're you're not wrong that it's 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 been underwhelming to this point. All right. Sam, do we want to move to Louisville? Yeah, um, on Louisville. That's obviously the I think you you were talking earlier about like once Louisville is off the board, then we can start to see other dominoes fall. Was I talking about that tonight or on my show? On your show. Yeah, or it was either that, or you said like once Will Wade decides, we'll see what happens. Yes, and I now think Will Wade like he may be stuck forever. I mean, that's not forever, but this year. But anyway, we'll get to that in a second. So, if you look, I've I've said this now like five times, but it not only does it align with everything I've been hearing from my most plugged in people around there, but it's also just kind of obvious if you know how these things work. Uh, and I'll reiterate it for those who who haven't heard it, but. Moments after Kenny Payne's final game, a Sports Illustrated article, and yes, I know Sports Illustrated is not what it once was. It's been gutted, but there's still a couple people there. Pat Forty, whatever you think of him, a Louisville-based, you know, sort of mainstream establishment sports writer with, you know, a certain credibility among, you know, the kind of insider crowd, right? He drops an article that is kind of styled a little bit more as like a column ish, but you could tell it was originally reported. I don't think he quotes Josh Hurd, the AD at Louisville in it, but he makes it eternally clear. It, it's eternally clear that Josh Hurd's fingerprints are all over that story because Hurd had said nothing up to that point. And then minutes after, you know, Payne loses the, the article drops, meaning it had already been in the hopper and written, right? And what it says is effectively that Louisville will not go after anyone with baggage, that Louisville will um, make an ambitious push for a Scott Drew or a Billy Donovan, but it acknowledges that they probably aren't going to get them. And then it says, given these, you know, basically it says like given these contours described of, you know, like someone without baggage and, you know, or, or you know, a super ambitious one. If you can't get the super ambitious one, the candidates likely in the mix are Dusty May and Josh Schertz. Now, that story came out before the tournament uh, selection show, right? By several days. So I always read it as follows. I think he wanted shirts because you don't drop shirts in there who's of relatively little like stature or fame among the kind of normie college basketball fan. You don't even hint at that if you're not really serious about it, but also you're doing that as a trial balloon. You're doing it to see basically to talk to your money people without talking to them directly. And if they say, great, Scott drew, that's who we want. Then it's on them to come up with the eight, nine, $10 million, whatever it is that most people would tell you Louisville really doesn't have, right? And so then he does a press conference the next day and he basically describes how he wants someone that will that will like crawl to Louisville, 
which again is code for, you know, someone who's not super established at a high major program, right? Because that, that person would not crawl there. So the only candidate I think he had in mind truly was Schertz, maybe Dusty May. But Dusty will have more options, and therefore would he crawl? I don't know. Now, what does Dusty May serve as? Well, he, along with maybe Jerome Tang and perhaps now Pat Kelsey, serve, I believe, as compromise candidates if the donors there kill the shirts idea and they're unable to get Billy Donovan or Scott Drew, which, let's be honest, is exceedingly unlikely. So if you'd ask me if, if shirts had got in last night, I think that would have provided heard with the cover to to take a really big you know kind of i don't actually think it's all that much of a risk because i think he's a terrific coach but on paper to kind of you know to spurn the conventional wisdom of the donors i think he would have uh gone after shirts it's not a coincidence that today the day after the pairings come out shirts gets more closely attached to st louis it's not done but it appears headed that way. And so I think that, you know, he's probably off the largely off the board at Louisville, which raises perhaps the most interesting question this cycle. If Dusty gets Michigan, DeVries, I think, probably ends up at West Virginia. I don't think DeVries, from what I've heard, is all that interested in Louisville. And so... Who is Louisville's compromise candidate, assuming they can't get one of those two mega names because of how expensive they are? And so the answer, if Dusty's gone, then see, that would be like the obvious compromise name. And maybe they get him. But if they don't, who's the compromise? Is it Tang? Is it, you know, is it is it like Pat Kelsey? That's another one where if Pat Kelsey wins two games this weekend, now you've kind of cleared those hurdles, right? And I think he, he can be safe at Louisville. But Louisville's in a weird spot if they can't get Dusty. You know what I mean? And if Michigan poaches Dusty tomorrow, I think Louisville's in a really, really weird spot because I don't think – because they've already basically said they're not going to go after Will Wade. They're not going to go after Musselman. They're not going to go after Beard because those guys have you know varying degrees of baggage, right? And it seems clear that he won't budge there. Now, maybe he does have to budge and a donor comes around. He's like, you're hiring Will Wade or you're gone. I doubt that um, because they're still paying off several buyouts. And, you know, I think they're reluctant to take certain risks and there's a lot going on there. But um, that's the one where I think it's very interesting uh, to, to, to follow along. Yeah, that's that's an interesting situation. If you end up with. If you end up. Not being able to get obviously um, Scott Drew, Billy Donovan. They're not the fact that, the fact that you're a win- sitting national championship head coach, as Forty reminds us in the article, has never left for a college for another college job. Ever. Massimino didn't leave Villanova. Uh, didn't he retire there? No, he went to UNLV. What? What year? The nineties. Probably master Jerry Tarkanian was at the UNLV. After after Tarkanian. Had he been had he been fired? Let's see. Was he? I'm looking it up. Then Forty got it wrong. He left after a few subpar years, Massimino left Villanova in nineteen ninety two to assume the head coaching job at UNLV. Okay. All right. Well, one one wonders if that was a little bit of a um, a soft landing play. And let's remember that that Villanova team that won it was like what an eight or nine seed. Yeah. So we're. But you know, I mean, UNLV about? was also like in scandal at the time. I think. Yeah. Anyway, if, if then forty's wrong, and it's been at least thirty years. My point is, it's it's largely without precedent. I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I, I don't. I, I I'm not. I'm saying I don't think it happens, but. And they end up ha- and like Louisville after all this talk of Wade or, or this, they just take themselves out of that. Of the Wade stuff. Of the yeah, they just take themselves out and, and like force them and shoehorn themselves into like a. And I think Pat Kelsey is a tremendous coach, but like, 
I, I feel like... I mean, would they take a look at Chris Jan? Like, if Chris Jans wins two games and beats North Carolina, like, does he get in the mix, you know? So there, there, are, there are things that could hypothetically emerge. So, essentially, what you're saying is Louisville still has no idea what they're doing. I think they'd probably like to think that they could... Land, like, it's kind of, I think, Michigan-Louisville for in the race for Dusty. And I'm not even sure both of them are hotly pursuing him right now. But you'd have to assume they are. And therefore, like, when he takes one, the other opens, you know? And the, But the point is, like, I can't see Louisville going to Kyle Smith or to DeVries or they want someone who's got at least some name and some cachet. And it doesn't appear they're going to – they're not going to get Chris – take Chris Beard. They're not going to take Will Wade. Like maybe Musselman gets his way back in there into the conversation, but I was never even convinced that that was a real conversation so much as just people sort of assuming it. Now, Mick Cronin would be the right candidate, but his buyout at UCLA is gargantuan. So that's where, you know, there's some people who think Mick's, you know, the guy, but it's just like, I can't see Louisville with their budget. And their their finances right now paying I think his buyout is like twenty eight million it's something Jesus insane. Christ. Google Google Micron and buyout. Um, I'm seeing twenty million before March thirtieth, sixteen before uh, March thirty first, twenty twenty five. Okay, so twenty million bucks like is is and then you got to pay him right? Yeah. Is Mick Cronin good enough that you'd pay 20 mil for him just to get the rights to him? No. You know yeah, what I'm I saying? Think so I think Mick Cronin's a really good coach. He's not worth that much. He's really good, but exactly. That's all That's all I'm saying. Now, like, we're, we're like you, huge Cronin fans on this podcast, but like, would you like, that, would you that's like, insane. how many, how often do you guys do this show, by the way? It's it very, it's like, this is the 55th episode of the last calendar year ish. That's a lot. We did, and, and like we did a lot in January. Um, we did a lot in November. Didn't do a ton in February. Did uh, did obviously we did like twelve or so in the off season, and then like so this is like the probably like the fortieth episode during the season. Got it. All right. What else you got? Sorry. So yeah, I think Jonathan, you want to ask about some of the Valley jobs. Yeah, we could go there next. Um, it's just going to be a very interesting offseason because you have three coaches that were fired, whether you thought they were good, to, that that you thought it was a good decision or not. Southern Illinois is open, UIC is open, Missouri State's open, and obviously it looks like Indiana State's going to be open and maybe Drake as well. So, all right. You, I mean, um, uh, sorry. What was the first one? Say it again. I'm really tired. Southern, Southern Illinois, and then Southern Wikimedia. Illinois. The word is the word now is increasingly Preston Spradlin. That'd be um, a really good hire. Yeah, I had heard weirdly. I never really knew if it was real, but I had heard from two really reliable people that um, Pat Scary was in the mix, and the really? reason was that the AD came from Towson. But then I found out that the AD like wasn't the one who hired him at Towson, so. Again, maybe that's, maybe just liked him. They did have some crossover from there. Boston. Like I can't see him. No, it's super him. weird. But hear me out. It's just no. It's just given the circumstances of Mullins' firing, which was, was surprise came as a surprise to most, and given Mullins' deep ties in Chicago, like you would a have to get someone who's really established and good because it's like Mullins is fairly good, and b you'd probably have to go out of region. So if you just add up those factors and you add in the connection, you know, with with Towson and the AD, I've heard crazier things. Um, and also, if you're going to fire Mullins, you have to presume they're kind of going to they, they're ambitious and they're going to pay a lot. Right. And scary probably would would get like a modest upgrade of like Pat scary, dollars, like, which is real money. So like I, I never really good. bought it, but I it was mean, it was too strange not to kind of share. You know, I think Scary's a good coach, but like, he's never made an NCAA tournament out of yeah, but a it's Southern league, Illinois, out of a out of a worse league than the Valley, which is essentially what they fired Brian Mullins for not doing. No, I get it. I get it. 
Brian, I think, what else? In that I league? think that essentially, if you're hiring from a worse league than the Valley at Southern Illinois, you can't hire someone that hasn't made the tournament or else firing Mullins was redundant. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair, but that, that ship sailed. So what do you want me to say? Missouri um, State, what do you think? Uh, McCollum, that's basically a done deal. F- yeah. Fantastic. That, yeah. that would be A+. Plus. If, yeah. if the Valley ends up getting McCollum and Spradlin, that, that would be, like, even if they lose DeVries and Shirts, you're, I, I'd feel fine about the coaches in that league. Okay, and then the next one, you are, Brian Mullins has Chicago, Illinois ties all over the place. He knows the area. <laughs> yeah, should he just go back and get UIC? Probably. UIC, yeah. I don't. I haven't heard anything about that opening. I got to be honest. Like, there's just okay. certain. Um, but yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Um, and then, do you know what Indiana State and Drake would be looking at if they would lose their coaches? I forget. I, I so I so Drake has become Drake a good job Alan since. Huss? Um. Yeah. So like, Drake has become a good job since. Uh, DeVries made it a good job. It really wasn't historically. They had one yes. really good year with Keno Davis in 07, 08. Medved had like a half a decent year, but it wasn't a great job. And now the rumor was that like it was about to pay DeVries if he stuck around north of a million. Even if he doesn't, I think they're they're at or near the top in, in the league in spend. And, you know, it's a small campus in Iowa. I think they, it's, there, there's, excuse me, there's a lot you can do there. And I, I'm just trying to think of like, who's in that part of the country. Um, Huss is an interesting name, but high point, you know, because obviously McDermott had um, for 17 years had DeVries on his staff and he had Huss for a while too. But I think that uh, high point might be like, high point is really investing. Yeah. High point probably pays better than Drake. And, and I just think like he's only been there a year. If he, has he was how, when when did he leave um Omaha last year? This is first year, so then yeah, maybe he wants to come back to that part of the country. How far is Omaha from Des Moines? For four hours? Oh, it's not far, yeah, not far. It, it's bordering states, yeah, but they're they're long states. Look it up. Omaha is right next to the Iowa border, and Des Moines is like smack dab in the middle of it's Iowa. two, it's two hours, okay. So then you know what. If he wants to get back there, likes that part of the country, whatever, sure, that'd be a big coup for Drake because he's pretty fucking good. And, but yeah, there's a lot to like about that. I agree. Yeah, I think that's probably it. I mean, it's a busy Valley off season with potentially five openings and three firings, two of which I really didn't think would happen. I was surprised. I was super surprised. Luke Yaklich got the improve your Ken Palm ranking by a hundred points and and um, get fired. M- Missouri State, I think everyone kind of expected to some degree because like their fan support is just really bad right now. And I think Dana did a fine job there, but they just like needed to get people interested again. Yep. All right. What else you got? Uh, I, I, I want to have a conversation about Canisius because that's a brutal job. Uh, sure. Have you, heard, have you heard anything on Canisius? I don't think they know what they're going to do, but I don't really know. I, I, all I heard on Canisius was – trying. how do I say this without giving anybody up? Uh, I had a really good idea for like a really strange hire somewhere, and I passed it along to – um, someone who could effectively get the person's name called and was told no, but what about that person's name for Canisius? When I, and when I went back to the candidate, he was like, no, fuck no, I'm not going, I'm, no. So is, is it, I, I, I'll, is it a name that, is, is it, do you have any sort of context on like what the name is? Obviously, don't give it up. But like, no, no, no. This is you would not. The person I'm suggesting is like someone you would never know. It's it's so it's, it's not even like a D two head coach. Uh, no. Okay. So it's not it's it's not like anything there. So just someone with someone 
I, I don't even know where this could have gone, but yeah, Kanish is a brutal job. Nobody really like I was I, I there were two names that I was hearing, and then I heard today that one of those names definitively doesn't want it. You guys hear me? Yeah, we can we can hear you. So I, I think Steve Curran seems to be the logical name there. I mean, yeah, he was at Bonaventure forever. He got all those kids. Now he's a great recruiter. He's very well regarded. He's he, you know, so he knows that Western New York area. And now he's at George Mason doing wonders, getting kids, I think. And um and yeah, yeah. That's one of the names I heard. Who? That that's one of the names that I yeah, heard. Yeah, that one is good. And then the like, other name I heard was Adam Cohen, and I was told that he does not want that job. I would think he probably doesn't want it. Like here's the thing. Adam that's probably Cohen a pay cut. I, I don't think he took Buffalo last year. I think he could have had that. And that's a better job. Oh, barely. But I think if you're – this is an interesting phenomenon, by the way. If you are a associate head coach like Adam Cohn at uh, Xavier, um, and you're probably making, I'm going to guess, in excess of $200,000 more than what they would pay you at Canisius. Absolutely. At a, at a minimum, a hundred thousand, one hundred fifty thousand, right? I mean, he's 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 probably making what five? He's probably making four, four, four twenty five, and and Kanisha's probably pays like two twenty five, two seven. Yeah, Kanisha, to Kanisha does not pay much. That that school doesn't have a ton of money, right? So, I mean, it's going to be hard to fill, and that's oh, the, and that's why the guy at Gannon would be a good name. Yeah. That that's the name that I've been Jordan that I've been Fee. I really want Jordan that, like, Fee. If Jordan Fee were to get Canisius, I would be extremely excited. Yeah, I mean, look, he he coached under Crutchfield, who's maybe the best coach in all of college basketball at any level. Um, D two legend went thirty six and zero last year, won a national title, and then Fee goes and takes a three and twenty two team to twenty six wins. Yeah, like he's elite. So, and all the guys on his, and he's from Erie, which is not far from Buffalo. It's like two hours. Yeah, and all the guys in the Crutchfield tree are good. So, that would be inter- interesting. I I'm trying to think. Like, there's a guy. I, I was hoping you would bring up Fee because I didn't want to bring him up. No, I'm always about that. In fact, somebody, a very prominent head coach, DM'd me recently. Someone you would know. It was out of nowhere. I had very little interaction with him. He just said, this is how search season has gotten in the last year. It's very strange. And he said, um, he pushed the name of the Oswego State coach as a future D1 head coach. And I was just like, okay, cool. He lost like at the buzzer in the round of 32 in D3 this year. But, you know, he is, I don't know. How far is Oswego from, from Canisius? Um, Oswego is Closer to here, I think, than Canisius. So probably two hours. I mean, let me see. I I don't even know. It's a hard job. Oh, okay, because... Oswego is like northwest of Syracuse. It's like right on Lake Ontario. Yeah. So how far is it from um, Canisius? Uh, let's see. It's a big country we have here. It's two and a half. Yeah, that's a little far. Um, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, I think you just find a ball coach who's a D3 or D2 guy or whatever, knows a little bit of upstate New York, Pennsylvania, the MAC landscape. Um, I mean, you guys are going to maybe say this is a little crazy. What about Jared Grasso? I've been, I've been saying I, I want, I want to see Grasso get another job at some point. And like, I was saying if Sacred Heart opened, that would be a really good, um, or, like, or if yeah. Sienna had opened. If Sienna had opened, I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure they would have. I'm not sure they would have um, had the money to go after him. Because yeah, but I think Grosso is sufficiently um, chastened from whatever that police thing was and whatever the fuck happened there. That like he probably doesn't have the leverage to be terribly picky about cash. Yeah, that makes sense. But, I mean, in Sacred Hearts, like, redoing their arena, so I'm assuming they're willing to spend. Well, they kept like, their coach. Yeah, I was surprised. I was honestly Same. a little surprised. I, I love Latina. He's a great guy. This is literally what is. every single person says. I've never met the guy. Everyone's like, eh, he never really wins, but what a wonderful person. Oh, no. he. Um, when I when I came up, um, when I, I saw him at 
uh, when they played Lemoyne, and he was like, "Damn, you came all the way up from here from from New York." And he's he's like he was like so excited to see me there. Like he, he's great. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's probably nice to have someone who cares about the Mac more than as much as the coaches but, in it. I'd be excited yeah, to. That was the NEC, but. <laughs> oh, good point. Good point. But like, I was I was thinking that with the move up in conferences, the redoing of the arena, that another conference tournament loss would potentially spell his downfall but like you know what i'm excited to cover him next year because the guy the the, the guy is he's, he's he's awesome like he's an awesome guy there's not there's not a ton of guy, there's not a ton of guys like that out there that are just as approachable as as he seems fair fair enough i mean I still think after a certain number of years they should try somebody else, but whatever. Oh, I'm not saying they shouldn't. What else you guys got? Should we uh should we talk Stanford? Let's talk Stanford. Bad weekend for Mitch Henderson. Yeah. Again, you know, like it or not, you know, these weekends, this time of year is tremendously impactful in terms Duke of prince into a sweet 16 i don't want to hear that i'm not saying it's fair i'm saying in many instances it's a reality and Do you know who the happiest man alive would be if mitch henderson left princeton you're gonna say brian earl and i'm gonna say no i'm gonna say steve donahue because he can't beat him oh that's true <laughs> um i should grab a little food for dinner here um <laughs> yeah um henderson like the guy took princeton to a sweet 16 he could get the same kids that he's getting at princeton at stanford and it wouldn't be like a downgrade to stanford's current talent it, it would definitely be a, a slight downgrade i mean stanford i don't think stanford's problem has been like getting in talent it's been using the talent like They've yeah, actually, Harrison, they, actually, they've had some talented teams. They've gotten Harrison Ingram and, like, Andre Stoyakovich and Cannon Carlisle. Like, their problem is not bringing in talent. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, um, I mean, look, the obvious name there is is Kyle Smith. Yeah. Um, but, like, if know, he's in play at Michigan. Maybe. Um, I do think, like, Listen, there's a really good athletic article. I think it's in The Athletic a few years ago about Kyle Smith. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying anything that isn't widely known, but he talks at great length about the – I think his son has – one of his sons has like a severe nonverbal autism stuff and needs a lot of space likes to be outdoors, it says in the story. As I was thinking about that, and somebody put it in my mentions, they're like, dude, do you know how fucking expensive like Palo Alto is? Um, I think stuff like that informs a lot of this shit, you know? So, I mean, he was at San Francisco. He was. You're right, but the kid's older now. That was like five, six years ago, you know? Yeah, I guess. Um. I'm just saying, like, you never know what's going on. Um, you know, he, he's been at he, – he has – what you wonder, like, why don't they give Randy Bennett a call? I don't think he'd take it. Yeah, but, like, at the end of the day, Stanford's still a better job than St. Mary's. St. Mary's doesn't exist – I don't know that St. Mary's, the institution, existed before Randy Bennett, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Did, what even is it? St. Mary's is Canisius with Rand, but with Randy Bennett. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like seriously, what the fuck is that place? Jeez, who was the St. Mary's coach before? Okay, they they made the NCAA tournament as an eight seed in. Uh, so they actually made the NCAA tournament in '97 before he got there. They made it in '89 before he got there. So not not awful. Two appearances ever? No, they want they made it in fifty nine as well. But like the, again, that's like a, it's not like a high. It, it's it's oh, it's the WCC. Like it's a one bid league. 
No, it's been a three bid league for for the better part of this decade. But at the time, it was not. Fair. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. He's he's a spectacular coach, and oh yeah, he's he's incredible. Stanford he is is right before. there and has a ton of money. And now now I still think they have to at least go knock on um, Madsen's door. You know. Ooh, that would that would that would ruffle some feathers. Yeah, I was about to say. So what? You know, they're out of the league. It's not the same league anymore. Now, now they're, they're in the ACC. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, Callis, you're right. Wait, Callis? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Callis, Stanford, Stanford, Stanford. That. You're right. I stand corrected. I told you I was really exhausted. My brain is okay. mush. Um, so, yeah. Now, I got to say, James Jones is always seeking to prove himself on a bigger stage. And I think because of Mitch Henderson's success in the tournament last year um, and Kyle Smith's success in the Pac-12 this year, and, you know, he was at, he was at Columbia as well, so another Ivy guy. James Jones has been overshadowed to a certain extent, and Amaker for years was really successful and overshadowed him had a little bit more of a personality. But James Jones, first of all, has the best staff in the Ivy League by far. Secondly, um, oh, yeah. they got a crazy good staff. Really good staff. And 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 secondly, uh, you know, James Jones, like, he can coach. And and it's strange. Yale had been because... the NCAA tournament in 50 years before he got, uh, before the heats of them there. And and he's been to like four in the last like six, right? Yeah, they, they hadn't been for I think thirty five years or sorry forty years when he got there, and he it took him like fifteen years to get to one or something like. And that. he's that's the thing. I James Jones has taken me very long to say this. He is the very rare college coach who's gotten much better with age. Um, now some of that is that Yale responded to Harvard's success of about. From like a decade ago, when it's when that streak for Harvard began, where Harvard had kind of this is going way afield here, but you know, in the Ivy League, there's kind of like this gentleman, there was always a gentleman's agreement about academics and what you could get in and what you couldn't. And basically, Princeton and Harvard kicked every, or Princeton and Yale kicked everybody's asses for you know four decades or whatever it was until one day some affluent Harvard alum and I got together and said, We want to be good. They hired Tommy Amaker, who was kind of like I can't remember if he got fired from Michigan or if it was a bit of a soft landing, but he's on his way out. And they gave him the resources and they gave him the admissions help he needed and they immediately became really good. I'm not saying they were letting in JUCO transfers, but I'm saying, you know, things changed. Now, this in turn prompted Yale to do the same. And once Jones was competing for the same caliber of player, he kind of surpassed Amaker, who's been pretty... Oh, he absolutely surpassed Amaker. Right. And, and, you know, then, again, it's a little ridiculous because they had no business winning that game yesterday. And if, he, if they didn't, we're probably not even talking about him for Stanford. But I'm just saying, like, if you're going to throw Mitch Henderson in the mix for Stanford, it's only fair to throw James Jones in that mix, too. And Jones, more so than Henderson, historically, has coveted other jobs, has had some opportunities, um, kind of wants to be at one of those places i think and so you know i don't yeah. think vandy will will he's not gonna be in the mix of vandy but i think i would i'd would be surprised if we didn't get an interview there and then the other one is that you have to um talk about at stanford that i think will be in the mix there and james also didn't go to yale so like it's it's not his alma mater yeah um but what i was gonna say is the other one uh that has to be in the mix for stanford and that again has a chance this weekend once again, to sort of prove himself on a national stage, you know who I'm going to say. You're you're not gonna, you're not gonna say Langle, are you? I am going to say Langle. Wow. Absolutely. Hmm. Why would I not? I mean, I feel like he's been kind of knocking on the doorstep for a couple of years now. The thing about yeah, Langle if he is... beats if he beats Baylor, and that's a big if because I I I tweeted you, Sam. <laughs> Did you see you see what I tweeted yesterday about that? No. I tweeted let me let me find How many it. people are watching this shit by the way? Right now, I don't know. I don't know how many concurrently, but over the course of the 
of the hour, we've had 1,200 people come in. You guys, you owe me some big money, man. You got the sage, <laughs> you got the sage bump. Yeah, I mean, we had what three, four hundred last night. That's a that's a three x as we would as we would say in the financial world. Yeah. So what I tweeted out was the year is twenty fifty seven. Colgate wins its thirty seventh straight Patriot League title, winning all games in Hamilton. The people say this is the year that Matt Langle and Colgate finally win a game, and they lose by seventeen to third seeded Notre Dame, coached by Braden Shrewsbury. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Look, I, I think I think Legmo's a terrific which, which coach. Kind of, which kind of preaches to the choir that like tournament success shouldn't be as heavily relied upon for these higher. No, I mean, look, I think I'll Lango's say this: a terrific coach, but I do think some of his game is like gimmick ball. No, Lango, they run great stuff. No, I, I, they do, but like, well, I, no, I the, the gimmick is that the Patriot League fucking blows. Yes, exactly. But he, in no small part, has kind of, like, made it blow. Like, he's just dominated so thoroughly in that league that, you know, it's kind of made the league. And remember, that prior to him getting there, I think it's pretty unanimously understood that Doubt, was, was, was the worst job in the league. They've won five or six titles in a row. Um, now, I think he has a really, really good deal there. And the thing about Langle, somebody described him to me. I was talking to an agent recently who described him to me as um, I was trying to describe him temperamentally based on some things I'd been learning and reading about and talking to people about. And this person was like, oh, so you're basically saying he's like the Amish of college basketball, which is a perfect, ex a perfect analogy. He doesn't seek to be. Uh, like he doesn't play the game, the search season game at all, right? In terms of kind of the, you have to realize, like, I mean, I think you guys probably get this, but like the coaches have to campaign. It's not just, and it's and it's subtle campaigning, and it's playing the inside game with certain people who are connected, in, you know, at at the highest levels. Also playing the outside game by like everything from, you know, having Goodman write something to having me say something. You know, I get hit up all the time in what is. Some are better than others at pretending it's like forming a relationship. Some are genuinely forming a relationship, and some are just being transactional, which is fine. But the point is, people are trying to operate at, you know, they're operators, and they're trying to get themselves in the mix on things. And the reality is, like, Langle, to his eternal credit, just he's like a throwback to a different era where it was just like, why don't you just look at my results? They speak for themselves. And that is absolutely true. Now, the question is, like, can he do it at Stanford? Well, I think he can because at Stanford, to a certain extent, it's self-selecting, right? Like, so all you're doing is basically saying, like, we need the smartest, best basketball players in the country to come here. And, yeah, maybe once in a blue moon a kid goes to Duke or something. But for the most part, you can kind of get those kids, you know, as you said. I know it's not an easy place to recruit to, but they had some studs under – Jared Haas. And so I think if you gave Langle some of those kids, I, I just think he's a more adept, calm, good coach. No, I mean I think he'd I think he would do a good job, but like I do I do wonder about his portability to a higher level. A well, who bit. would you say would be good there besides Kyle Smith? I mean I I, I think I mean, as you mentioned, like Bennett would obviously be good there. Madsen, what, Madsen is the name that I think would have would be. Well, yeah, they could have hired him last year, but assuming he doesn't leave Cal, right? Who else? And Bennett doesn't leave St. Mary's. Like, would you call Chris Gerlofson at San Francisco? He's been pretty good, but again, like he inherited a really good situation. Inherited a really good situation, and they have a really good NIL situation at San Francisco. Weirdly, really? um. And so would it, would it be would it be crazy to say that like I would call Sendak before I'd call Gerlofson? Uh Sendak's got a great staff. Th their development's insane there. Does Herb I haven't watched Herb Sendak since he was at NC State. I mean, he's a hell of a coach. He's a survivor. He's he's gotta be in his mid sixties at this point. He's old. He's, old. he's not sure. that old. He started coaching so young. You guys watched Santa Clara. You are some sick fucks. 
Dude, they're so fun. We watch, we watch like everyone. You don't have children. You don't have jobs. Um, I watch like the A10, some Big East, and Indiana State. That's and I watch Kentucky. I watch Dalton choice. Connect. Like I your could family, not tell your you, religion and Josh shirts. I I could not tell you one player on Iowa State. The That's big crazy. I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of people can't tell you one player on Iowa. Yeah, State. I'm just saying. Like the Big Twelve is like I just. It's like it's Big Monday. It's like now nah, I'll do a spaces. I'm not watching. Yeah, um, you did the spaces during the Texas Houston game that was like really close. Oh, good memory. I don't remember that. What else you guys got? It's Can people like some other high majors that we haven't brought up, right? Just kind of some rapid fire with some of the high majors. Like, what what do you expect at Oklahoma State? Three things I've heard. Uh, would, and this could get the carousel really humming, would Buzz Williams look for a soft landing? Hmm. A soft uh, landing? He's made the you, you really think he's that much – that in danger there? No, I think he's bored. He doesn't usually stay at places for longer than five, six years. He, you know, if you watch his press conferences, he's always sort of exasperated. It's a little bit of a, a shtick. It's kind of what he is. Yeah, but he's always left places at at five or six years. Um, did it at Marquette. Did it at Virginia Tech. Yeah, and and they also have a new AD coming in at Texas A and M. So right, they hired. Um... They oh, had, yeah, they hired the Nebraska guy, right? Right, yeah, Trev, uh, Trey, Trev Albert. Uh, Trev Albert, yeah. The guy who was picked over uh, The guy who was picked over Trent Dilfer, and Mel Kuyper freaked out about it. So, yeah, I mean, like, that's usually a sign that, like, not that he's imminently going to get fired at all, but it's just, you know, you want to get ahead of it maybe, right? And Oklahoma State maybe is a job that would work for him. Uh, who else? I, I think Steve Lutz will get a look. Um mm. I haven't heard a whole lot of names down there other than those two. I, I, I'm trying to name that. That one kind of – some people thought he was going to get another year. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. Like, is there a Big 12 assistant, you know, in the in the Jerome Tang mold that might go that direction? I don't know. A name what? that I wrote down um, like a month ago as like, hey, this would be fun. Um, his team fell apart. But, like, Ron Hunter would be fun there. Yeah, I, I mean the Big Twelve. The Big is, Twelve needs at least one coach that's just say "fuck it" offense. Yeah, but he's not getting it done at Tulane. Yeah, no. Yeah, he's. Not. I mean, like, I think Ross Hodge is going to be that dude soon. He hasn't done enough in year one at North Texas to to get it. But like, if he can kind of like win the NIT again, I mean, I know it wasn't him last year, but. If he could make a deep run there, would it would would he get a look? Probably not. I'm just saying. Well, like, they'll, they'll probably have already filled it by then. Right, but but like, who would you guys mention? At Oklahoma State, Oklahoma oh, tough State job. Tough one, because like, I, I feel like you got to go. And I feel like there's a bunch of different ways you can go there. Like Lutz, as you mentioned, I think would be. I think Lutz is a terrific coach, but that would be a big jump. Southland to CUSA to Big Twelve in, in one in, in the span of two years. That that's a really, really big jump. I agree. I'm just saying, I, like, you know, who's the dude? I, mean, I don't think there's anyone obvious. Because like and again, guys a guy like I mean, would would Amir get it? That's that's actually that's actually that's who I was gonna say. But yeah, I mean, like Amir, and like CUSA to American to sorry, I'm not A Sun to American to um, to Big Twelve is a little bit more palatable. Like, could could Medved work there? I mean, uh, he he. I would don't win, see why not. He would win 18 games there. Yeah, I mean, it's a hard job. I mean that that's where Will Wade should go, right? The, at the end of the day, Oklahoma State. No one gives a fuck about whatever transgressions Will Wade has committed. You're Oklahoma State. No one is sitting here thinking you're Stanford. So just do it. 
that is what they should do. I, I don't know that they will do it, but that's the only obvious answer. And I think they might be desperate enough to do it and take the risk. Okay. okay. Um, some other high majors that are open. Going to go. You watch a lot of ball. What'd you say? Where do you think Will Wade's going to go? I mean, I think West Virginia would be wise to. I don't think they're doing look, but they're not going to give him a look. Um, and at that point, what other high majors are, are out there, really? Because you're looking at Louisville, who's not going to take him, as you mentioned. West Virginia, Washington's pretty much already made their hire. Washington's made their pick. We haven't done West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, but um, we'll, we'll get into West Virginia after I answer this. Like, Wade probably – I mean, Oklahoma State might be the place for him at this point, Think now that I think about it. It's the only place for him because the other ones are too reluctant to pull the trigger – and he's a really great coach. Like, I'll tell you another thing. What if Bucky McMillan wins two games this weekend? Hmm. Be- Not one yeah, I thought about. If your Kevin window, Ford, your window is that. very brief. Last year, Bob Ritchie was a hot name this year. Where is Bob Ritchie today? He lost his two NBA caliber players. Maybe not NBA. I'm just NBA saying, though, right? The point is... He didn't make the jump. You got to yeah. make the move fast. Also, oh, Furman pays well, right? Um, I assume they pay fairly well. I don't know. Yeah, because that that's a that's like a, a private school with like big with like I know there's a lot of money in like a, around that school. I mean, like, look, maybe Pat Kelsey goes to Oklahoma State if if oh, you Pat, Pat Kelsey Pat Kelsey is so electric, like. Maybe not a may, there's maybe not anyone in the country that's more of a press conference winner, and I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way. I mean, that well, in a good guys, way. guys, you're talking, oh, I'm to, sorry. You're ta- guys, you're talking to a UMass man, he sure as shit didn't win that press conference. Yeah, well, you, know, you have to show up to win it, but <laughs> <laughs> but every time he does show up, he he electrifies the room. I I I I should have been a little bit more sensitive there. I apologize. Yeah. I should be but, cutting the show short now. Carry on. Yeah, but um, I had a conversation with Kelsey, um, me and two other guys after they played um, Hofstra, and like he's just like he's looking like he he's he's like a and we were talking about like the Cincinnati Reds and like the Bengals cuz like he's he's a sicko about those teams and like no he's, he's passionate he's passionate he's, he's engaging he's a passionate guy his, he can be charming he's very he's very he's very uh no I get it I get it and like his kids like that's a that's a story I I think he I think to most people he's a guy that would really make to most people, he's a guy that would make them smile. Thanks for that analysis, Sam. For, obviously not for you. Most people, he would make smile. Well, it's a difficult business. There's more and he's, and he's a smiling. terrific coach as well. He's a, he, he won a lot of no, games. he's at, very good. Pat Kelsey's he won ready, a lot of no games doubt. at Winthrop, and now he's back-to-back tournaments at Charleston. They, he won 31 games last year and 27 this year. That, that, that doesn't happen. Like, he's very good. I, I, I think that. there's that's probably what top five most wins of any program in the country over the last two years. Probably UConn, yeah. FA, UConn, FAU, Charleston, probably. Probably, yeah. Houston, Purdue, maybe. What else we got? We go to, should we go to West Virginia? Yeah, West Virginia. Um so I think Ren probably was tar- Ren Baker was probably targeting um Dusty originally, and it's just not going to happen. Um, I never say never, but I don't see dust. Like, I think there's a consensus around, like, if you have leverage right now as a coach, what I'm hearing when I talk to guys, the guys who are really smart and thinking about this, like, the long for the long haul. And I think you could count Dusty in this camp, so you have to infer he sort of sees it a little bit this way. The SEC and Big Ten are where you want to be if you have leverage, right? 
And then for a guy who's been in Boca and Gainesville, I just don't think like Morgantown cuts it. I'm sorry. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, they have an unbelievable fan base. There's a lot going for them, but I'm just, I'm just saying like, this is how a lot of people think about these things. And it's all leverage, right? Like, yeah. If Louisville announces a place tomorrow, announces somebody tomorrow and, you know, Chris Mack goes to Vanderbilt and Michigan calls DeVries or something. And Dusty is like, oh, shit, I got to get a job. Then, yeah, there's a universe in which you could go to West Virginia. Um, but I just don't see it happening. So then who would go? Well, for a while, I was pretty high on Medved because his wife's family is really connected there. And Minnesota never opened, which was like the job a lot of people foresaw him going to. The Byington thing was not real. I can tell you that with relative certainty. And there was never a handshake agreement, blah, 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 blah. However, I think Byington has possibly played his way into the job by virtue of winning his league and by virtue of the, the sort of reach candidates that they coveted being uh, no longer, you know, uh, available or interested, right? I still think Pat Kelsey would get a look. And believe it or not, I've heard from at least one, no, two sources, two good sources, that they that they have at least expressed some interest in, uh, in Kyle Smith. Believe it or not, um, and that has a little shades of beeline to it also, um, and you know, so that's that's pretty fascinating. And then Devries now has has gotten his name a little bit tossed around there in a serious way in the last kind of week or so DeVries is very hot right now like for some reason I, I don't know whose fault this was but I feel like it's kind of revealing how little buzz DeVries got until like a week ago you know and I love shirts I think he's outstanding I think he's more excited that team is more exciting to watch than Drake but Drake won the league fair and square and they won two out of three against Indiana State and He's just really good. Now, the consensus for a time was that he was always going to be the Creighton successor, right? And still maybe. Um, and so he was there for 17 years as an assistant, which is pretty incredible. And with McDermott deciding to stay, I think that itself, plus the winning of the conference title, you know, pretty quickly elevated DeVries to a different tier. And now he could be in the mix at West Virginia and at a few other places. Um, Byington, I still think, is real. And, like, if they won two games this week or whatever, then obviously that would become a much easier sell. Uh, and I do think the Shaheen Holloway thing, I don't think it was real, real, but I think it's, you know, probably Shaheen trying to leverage it for a raise or more NIL or whatever. Um, am I missing anyone? Um you think Dustin Kearns has a chance? Has a chance, or is it? No, that, and I never really did. Yeah, I mean, I think he would be a terrific hire somewhere. I think he's got a. I think he's wanted some really. Yeah, uh, I mean, could Oklahoma State like take a look at him? You know, oh, I I think that would be I think that would be a hit there. Yeah, it's it's you know it's they're they're tough schools in states with lots of other, well, in Oklahoma, really only Oklahoma, but you know it's like they're not first fiddle in the state. You know, and I think that's an interesting thing to, to sort of build off of. Yeah. Um, just going to do some rapid fire because we're, we're, um, we're running out of time here. Um, Good, because I'm falling asleep. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, what do you think about uh, Vandy, just quickly? I don't know if reports about Chris Mack are true. I, I tried to hunt it down a little, and I got some cryptic answers, which would suggest that maybe it is true. Um I actually think shirts would be fantastic there, and it doesn't get nearly enough chatter. Didn't he coach in Nashville? Yeah, well, not Nashville, but whatever that Lincoln Memorial was, I think it was like, it's in Tennessee. It's not like terribly far, but, you know, so he knows that recruiting yeah. landscape. Not that, you know, you can recruit Nashville. Because I'm pretty uh, sure that when we talked to Casey Alexander, he was like, they played against uh, shirts when he did a secret, like a secret scrimmage or at some point or something like that. I don't know. 
Yeah, so I think Schertz would be fantastic there. Um, and I think Kyle Smith would be fantastic there. And I guess Mac would be solid. I, I'm just – Mac is a really good coach. I'm just kind of of the mind, like – I'll be honest, it's a bias of mine, but for the most part, retreads just don't excite me. Um, I mean, I think there's – I mean, I – I think sh- like when Sean Miller got Xavier, I wasn't like overly excited about it, but he's terrific. And, and honestly, I was, I wasn't as high on Thad Mata when he got Butler and now he's done a terrific job. Uh, so honestly, I think retreads, some of them, some of them really don't work, but like Chris Mack, I feel like is a retread that would work. The guy won 68% of his games as, as a head coach. Um, and like Louisville, he won he won twenty five games in his second year at Louisville. Finished tied for second in the ACC, and then COVID happened and everything fell apart. Fair. I mean, the Dino Gaudio thing was a bad look too. Yeah, but like I, I think Mac is really good. I mean, I, I think that would be an exciting hire for Vanderbilt. Um quickly on, on some other, uh, mid-major jobs. Um, I feel like, uh, are there any other jobs that you think might open? Leonard Hamilton might retire. And who do you think could get in there? Mac, Wade, Amir. Um, it's a good three. It's a good three. No, no Dennis Gates, right? No Dennis Gates. That's yeah, who Leonard made, wanted as a successor. And going 0 and 18 in the league uh, yeah. is not a great way to you, hear you yourself. Sell 0 and 18. That, that's okay. Fine. I also like just don't think that Florida State is like a better job than Mizzou. Yeah, that was um, that. That's been a take of yours for a while. Who do you think could be in at Loyola, Maryland? That is a weird one. <laughs> The consensus there was that it would be Leffler, you know, the assistant at Cincinnati who was for- formerly at Johns Hopkins, or uh, Manning, the assistant at Maryland who was on, uh, who went to Loyola, and Leffler, for what it's worth, was on the staff at Loyola way back. Now the question becomes: They hired, um, what's the kid's name? Bowlesby, the search firm. The only kind of transparent, slightly bespoke search firm in the game that makes a point of talking about the outside the box and original hires they've made. To their credit, by the way, they hired Josh Schertz at Indiana State, and they've, you know, really made a name in the industry as kind of the "we'll do it our way, we'll do our own thing, we won't be transactional," and all the things that people criticize search firms for. Well. What is the point if you're the Loyola athletic director in hiring him if you have two alumni, basically people with clear cut ties to the school who kind of meet the profile? And the answer to me is like, well, because you're not going to hire either of them. And if you are going to hire either of them, then what was the point of hiring the search firm? You, some will say to cover their ass. OK, fine, but it's still the AD who makes the call and you're still going to have to work for that person. So what was your original question? Sorry. Oh, it's just like, what do you think? Who do you, who do you think gets it? <laughs> oh, so, I mean, I would love them to go buckyball and hire, like, Blair Academy's Joe Mantegna, John Carroll, formerly of Northfield Mount Hermon, who, who runs the New York Wrens. That's an interesting one. That would be the best hire of the cycle. They won't do it. They're they're just not going to be. You've got all the connections up there. Bold enough. Yeah, he would get every kid, and, and they'd get smart. And everyone loves would... him. Like, from what I know, everyone loves him. No one has ever said a bad thing, and uh, he was on. You can listen to my uh, UMass basketball podcast where he was on. He was uh, one of the best guests we've ever had. He's one of the most like philosophically rooted people. He would send 10, 11 kids at a high academic school to D one every year. He runs the top AAU team in New York now. You know that had Philip House. Is that, what, is that what he's doing now? He, he's the chair of the Rens. He consults. He does a bunch of things, but he should be coaching because. And I was talking to a high major assistant about him, and they were talking about um, Columbia. He was like, 
if he got if he's like if that guy got the Columbia job, they would they would build a statue outside there in three years. So it's like, why wouldn't you just hire him at Loyola? Because, and again, Leffler is very good. What do you think that would cost? Whatever, not that expensive. They're going to pay that job's going to pay like three hundred grand. So, if you're Loyola and you're like the shittiest academic school in a high academic league, you need to come up with something creative. Like Leffler's very good, and the, but the question is like, why hire a search firm to bring a guy back who was in Baltimore a year ago and who used to work at your school? Like, what's the point of hiring the quirky search firm? That's why something there is a little off. I think I heard tonight that Krikorian interviewed there from Christopher Newport. Ooh. So that would be a very, very, very good hire. Um, although I've always heard his dream job is Navy, and then uh, and that job doesn't. Appear is he open. a masochist? <laughs> well, I mean, he coached at the Coast Guard. He's an Ivy League dude. He's like five five and really intense. I mean, you know, it checks the boxes. Okay. Um, you have to be some sort of masochist to have a service academy as your dream job if you're a college basketball coach. Landry Kozmalski at Swarthmore would be a good hire at Loyola. Um, he's killed it at a super high academic school. Yeah. Kevin App at Williams would be really good. Um, mm -hmm. So a bunch of those D3 guys. But, yeah, the only one that would excite me was would be like a high prep guy like Carroll or Mantegna. They won't do it though. They're like the Northeast. Like it's it's so revealing because with Bucky McMillan, it's like I've always been saying, just hire the best high school coaches, especially the high prep ones who get PGs. You know, who are 19, 20 years old, and you know they have ten of them a year. Like especially in the portal era, by the way, where you have to build teams. You know, for the year. Uh, yeah, but, a, lot of Har a lot of Hargrave um, guys are are coaching in D one right now. Um, yeah, a Hargrave uh, Thomas and... Messenger uh, at yeah. NJIT. Yep. He'll be a head coach someday. Yep. Um, not ready now because he's on a staff that didn't win enough games, but, you know. And that, uh, that's a really good staff, though. Very good staff. Very good staff. Multiple future head coaches. I think you're right. Um, and, yeah, like, I don't know. It's just like you're Loyola. You're a Patriot League school. If you just do the generic thing, you're going to be the fourth best team in the league, third best team in the league, whatever it is. What do you have to lose? Like, literally, what do you have to lose? Now, the only thing you have to lose is a little bit of perception. Somebody out there would be like, they hired a high school coach? That's an affront to me and my profession. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, okay. If you look at the people who've been assistant coaches at Northfield Mount Hermon, it's like, because I'm very familiar with that school because it's near where I grew up. Prominent Nick Scout. Uh, you know, a guy who's a big agent under Brett Just. Uh, an assistant at Colgate. I mean, like, they all came under Carroll. And I think Mantegna has probably similar people who've worked under him. So I don't even know. They, they won't do it. But it's just like, that's the if I was running a search firm, that's like the very obvious answer. Go high prep or high D3. Um, and don't overthink it. Okay. Um, what maybe, about William and Mary? Yeah, I was I was about to say, like, what do you think about William and Mary? Because that's that's an interesting job in that league. I mean, if you could be a little bit uh, quicker, because we we got to get out of here soon. Um, Brian Earl. Would he leave? Wow. Uh, I yeah. think Cornell's kind of a shit job, and nobody it really is, wants to acknowledge that. It is, but like, it's remember, a, he's the Princeton guy. So if 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 Henderson leaves, then he would you know slot in. If he doesn't, Cornell is a really tough place to win. He had to totally reinvent the offense. We'll see how long that works. Um, they lose some guys. I don't know. I think long and hard about it. Okay. I don't know his family situation. I, you know, I don't. I don't know. I mean. Pretty sure his brother is the coach at Chattanooga. Yes, is it Dan Earl? Dan Earl, yeah, yeah. Um, Long Long Beach is an interesting one. That that's that's a good job, right? I have no idea. I I would assume it's a good job. The West Coast remains a little bit of a mystery to me. I'll be honest. All right, then I, I then I I won't go, I won't go there. 
Um, do you have any thoughts on like Mercer or Rice or apparently the guy who they hired at Mercer, like several oh, people I really trust, like super X and O freaks, said that that was like the hire of the cycle. Who? Who'd they hire? I forget his name. He's from Tennessee Martin. Oh, yeah, that guy. Apparently he's fantastic. So kudos to Mercer. Yeah. Um Ryan Ritter. Yeah, people like I got several unsolicited comments about like Mercer just won the cycle type shit. I'm like, all right, whatever, let's pump the rakes. I don't even know who this guy is, but apparently he's great. Yeah, I, I just realized I have to make a list of I, I have to add some of these names to the to the jobs that I have on my spreadsheet because I'm behind. I didn't have Ritter on there. I didn't have Clanch on there. Um, he got the UTSA job, correct? Wait, Clanch did? Yeah. Today? Yesterday. Oh, that's big news. Yeah. Good for him. He's long been kind of the search firm darling, and he's always a finalist and never closes. And then last year got stuck with um, – He with, left to be uh, an assistant. Going back to being an assistant. Who won the Southland? Oh, Will Wade, obviously. Yeah. All right. I'm out. I'm, I'm going to fall asleep. I'm so, so, so sorry. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Later, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll make this a yearly thing. Anytime. Uh, maybe, maybe even more than yearly, but that, that was a great show. Um, thank you for, thank you to everyone for, and he's gone. <laughs> Jonathan, you want me to close this anything? out? Jonathan, do you, have, do you have anything you want to add before your fantasy baseball drafts? Oh, no, I, I actually don't. We covered so much tonight. That was an excellent show. So um, tomorrow night, no show. But Wednesday okay. night is our big show. Our biggest show of the year. Okay, no. Our biggest show of the year is the night before the season starts. Yes. But our Maybe our second biggest show of the year, where Jonathan and I will talk you through every single pick in our bracket. From game to game, we will debate. We will choose the winners. I was just going through the bracket um, for a second for a second look over right before we started this show. It was really fun. That's going to be Wednesday night after the Boise State Colorado game. So midnight, basically. It'll be late. If you're a real college basketball sicko, you'll be there, though. It'll be worthwhile. It'll be worth it to stay up late for that show. Hopefully, I'll um, – and we'll also have our picks on Brackets, Bubbles, and BitStealers.com. Yes, um, Jonathan. All time. right. If you if you came to hear about Tyler Self and where he's working, you came to the right place. If you came to hear about the shenanigans that are search season – you came to the right place. And if you oh, came, come on. You can do better than that. You can I do can't, dude. That. that was just such a, like, serious show. If you came to hear about Navy as a dream job. <laughs> and if you came to hear about Caleb Grill and what he's up to, you came to the right place. This is Season 4, Episode 55 of Brackets, Bubbles, and Fit Steelers. We'll see you Wednesday night.